Today on Real Life, Unbroken Faith, Diane Doko Kim shares her encouragement for parents of special needs kids. And on Miracles in American History, how a freak accident changed the course of the Civil War after prayer and fasting. In Real Life Coaching, Living the God-Breathed Life, Bible scholar and teacher Tom Gardner begins his coaching session on finding God's rest at his table. That's today on Real Life. This is real life. God loves you. Jesus died for you. The Holy Spirit, He empowers you. And the Bible is your and my guide to abundant life. I'm your host, Don Black, with my beautiful co-host and bride, Terry, and our beautiful co-co-co-co-co-host. Co- 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 <laughs> oh, Pastor, four I gave you four co yeah. Pastor Amy it's Schaefer. Hey, yes. so, you're, coming, you're rising up in the Coco yeah. world. I know. <laughs> Coco Chanel, co-co-host here. Coco, co-co host. We're so yeah. happy that you've joined us for this program. <laughs> we're, we're excited because the Lord is moving in a mighty way. And you know, ladies, today I have on my spirit this, and it's not just been for today, it's been the last couple of weeks, this whole uh, thought of rest. Hmm. You know, <laughs> well, they must harmonize. You see that harmony? <laughs> they feel the same. The Lord is just telling me that we need to find a place of rest. You know, we've missed, okay. we've missed so much opportunity with, with not knowing what a Sabbath is. Okay. Yes. So you're talking about, like some people say rest is sleeping in bed or a watching a favorite TV show yeah. or napping. So what do you mean by rest? Well, no, th- those are all ways to relax maybe. Or, well, mm-hmm. sleeping's not relaxing. You've got to sleep. Mm-hmm. Sleeping is part of re- recuperating and rebuilding our bodies and our minds. I'm, I'm talking about finding that place of peace mm-hmm. with God. Mm-hmm. That place of rest where you are outside of the, the uh, noise of the world yeah. and you're into a place of just, uh, uh, what's the right word? Uh, just uh, peace. Quietness. Quietness. Right. Mm-hmm. You're well, listening. Yes. Listening to God. Yeah. A place where you can be in His presence. So don't you hunger for that, desire yes. that? I know I do. Mm-hmm. I do. But I can't seem to step into that place because I keep, Staying so daggum mm. busy. Yes. And that daggum, that Ooh. comes Dag-gum. from, that comes from, that comes from Barney Five. Daggum. Well, is it like more of a, um, what is it? There's the scripture that talks about be still. Is that what you're referring to? Being well, still, still before God. Be, be God. still. Be still mm-hmm. and know that I am God. Mm-hmm. I, there's a lot in that, in that scripture that really does speak, right. speak to that I have to rest because I'm not in charge. I yeah. think the thing for is is becoming willing to surrender, Terry, Mm -hmm. willing to give up control and allow God to take control. Mm -hmm. And if you're not behind the wheel, then you can maybe be at peace. Well, sometimes I'm sure both of you as leaders um, in church and here, it's like there's so many opportunities and there's so many things that you feel that God has opened doors for Mm -hmm. you to do. And you feel compelled to do those because they are God doors, Mm -hmm. right? Where there has to be a balance. I'm sure all of you feel that way too. Like there's so many things out there to do. What, how do you measure what's really well, God ordained? What you learn in that stillness and in that quietness, and you learn this is that not every good thing is a God thing. Mm-hmm. And that you're not supposed to do everything That's that right. people ask you to do or the opportunities that come your way. You want to do the God thing. Yeah. That's why you have to get alone with God. As a believer, it is an essential to get quiet before the Lord mm-hmm. where you're not just talking to Him, but maybe He's just talking to you, or maybe mm-hmm. there's just a stillness down deep in your soul. I love what one of my mentors in the faith said. He said, the more a believer spends time with God and in his presence, the, they're, they're, they're not quick to judge. They're mm-hmm. quick to walk in love. And he said, and there's a calmness and a steadiness about their life. And mm-hmm. I just thought, that's exactly what I want. Even though yeah. there's a bunch of life going on and opportunities and leadership and movement that's good, 
I want there to be a calmness and a steadiness in my soul mm -hmm. where it's not like a tornado inside. It's not mm -hmm. an emotional craziness. There's a steadiness that comes in the presence of God. Well, mm -hmm. that's my goal. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. I want you at, uh, who are watching, would you pray with me for the Lord to give me uh, the uh, wisdom and uh, discernment and uh, mm -hmm. I guess just the, the determination yeah. to do that mm -hmm. as I pray for you, as we pray mm -hmm. for them, because a lot of you are just like me. I know I talked mm -hmm. to a lot of people about this and I've talked to several pastors that are in, in the area that are feeling the same thing. There's a time for rest. And it's in our regular schedule. That's what the Sabbath's all about. That's why God programmed us with a Sabbath, a seventh day of rest. We, it, we need that. And it's beyond mm -hmm. sleep. It doesn't mean you're tired. It means you need to be refreshed in the spirit. Right. That's really what yep. it means. So I'll pray with you. You pray yeah. with me. And we'll just watch God take us to a new place, mm -hmm. to a new place. You know, in our coaching that's coming up, there's going to be a whole, this whole topic of rest is really what's on, on the table with our coaching. So you don't want to miss it. We'll learn from God. We'll be right back. Are you aware of this intervention as a result of prayer during the Civil War? The Confederate Army was unstoppable. Within weeks of winning the Civil War, President Lincoln proclaimed August 12, 1861, it is fit to bow in humble submission to his chastisement, to confess and deplore their sins and transgressions, in the full conviction that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Therefore I, Abraham Lincoln, do appoint a day of humiliation, prayer, and fasting. Robert E. Lee had won the Second Battle of Bull Run and was marching 55,000 Confederate troops into Maryland, September of 1862. Then something happened. Union Private Barton Mitchell was drinking coffee and noticed three cigars on the ground wrapped in a piece of paper. It was a misplaced copy of Lee's Special Orders No. 191 addressed to Confederate General D.H. Hill, revealing Lee's battle plans. With this information, Union General George McClellan ambushed several Confederate brigades 70 miles from Washington, D.C. at the Battle of Antietam, September 17, 1862. Lincoln then proclaimed another day of fasting. Nations like individuals are subject to punishments and chastisements in this world. May we not justly fear that the awful calamity of a civil war may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins? Lincoln added, we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we've become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for forgiveness. Lincoln ended, I do set apart the 30th day of April, 1863, as a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. Two days after the day of fasting, another freak accident changed the course of the war. General Thomas Jackson was considered one of the greatest tactical commanders in history. Holding ground at the first battle of Bull Run, standing there like a stone wall, he was nicknamed Stonewall Jackson. Often outnumbered seven to three, Jackson successfully fought the Shenandoah Valley Campaign, Battles of McDowell, Front Royal, Winchester, Port Republic, Seven Days Battles, Second Battle of Bull Run, Antietam, and Fredericksburg. On May 2nd, 1863, after inflicting a crushing attack on the Union flank in the Battle of Chancellorville, Confederate General Stonewall Jackson surveyed the battlefield and was returning to camp at twilight. Suddenly, one of his own men shouted, halt, who goes there? But without waiting for a reply, a volley of shots were fired. Two bullets hit General Jackson's left arm. One hit his right hand. Several men accompanying him were killed. In the confusion, they evacuated Jackson, but dropped him off the stretcher. His left arm had to be amputated. General Lee sent a message through Chaplain B.T. Lacey. He has lost his left arm, but I, my right tell him that I wrestled in prayer for him last night as I never prayed for myself. 
growing weaker with pneumonia. Jackson said May 10th, 1863. It is the Lord's day. My wish is fulfilled. I have always desired to die on Sunday. A few moments before he died, he said, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. Civil War historians believe that had General Stonewall Jackson been alive and commanded two months later at the Battle of Gettysburg, the South may have won the battle and possibly the war. Jackson's death was difficult to reconcile as he was exemplary in virtue. He was against slavery, freeing the slaves he inherited from his wife's estate. He violated a Virginia law which forbade teaching slaves to read by teaching a Sunday school class for both enslaved and free African Americans at Lexington Presbyterian Church. President Franklin D. Roosevelt stated September 17, 1937, I came into the world 17 years after the close of the war between the states. Today, there are still many among us who can remember it. It serves us little to discuss again the rights and the wrongs of the long four years war. We can but wish the war had never been. We can and do revere the memory of the brave men who fought on both sides. But we know today that it was best for the generations of Americans who have come after them that the conflict did not end in a division of our land into two nations. I like to think that it was the will of God that we remain one people. America has a history of crisis and prayer and God intervening. It's important for us to remember these stories of prayer and faith in American history. You know, it's without question that the Lord preserved this union and he did it for his own purposes. And I can, I can venture a, a reason why he did that. Uh, because he, he called the United States to be the launch pin for the gospel, mm -hmm. to take the good news of Jesus around the world, to fulfill what we call the Great Commission. That's what, that's what the United States, the church in the United States is call on. Right. If our nation had been divided, ladies, yeah. then we would have not had that platform to be able to do that. Right. Right. See, in oh, God's right. kingdom, it's all about what he's doing. And all these things that are happening in the natural are subplays. Mm -hmm. They're subplots. Yep. But I got to tell a quick story, real quick story. Terry and I were first married, we had just gotten married, we lived in Virginia, and, and Terry was uh, greatly pregnant with, was, our, with our first much. son. <laughs> first and, daughter. No, oh, first daughter, that's yeah. right. Oh boy, oh, oh. <laughs> but But I, I took, I was writing a book called Virginia Civil War, so I took Terry out with me, and we were exploring all these sites, right, all over around the state of Virginia. Yeah. And I had read once that when Stonewall Jackson's left arm was amputated, okay. that they took it, Lacey, his chaplain, took it, they don't, they used to just throw them in, the, in a big pile of arms and legs when they mm -hmm. amputated. But he took the arm and he took it to his family cemetery and he buried it in his family cemetery. Stonewall Jackson's arm. Left, left arm. arm. Okay. And so I, I went, Terry and I went out, we went to the state, uh, to Chancellorsville, to the na National Park. And we asked them that and they, the, guy, the guy said, oh, and he reached back underneath his desk and he put out this piece of paper, oh. handwritten map. And he said, go here, this is called Elmwood, go there and I'll, this will take you to where it's buried. And so we went right. and found where Stonewall Jackson's left arm was oh, buried. Right. Wow. And sure enough, out behind the house, up in the cornfield in a little family cemetery was some of the family markers. Right. Oh, wow. But there was a marker that said, here lies the left arm of, of General Stonewall Jackson. Yep. And it was quite a, quite an amazing thing. It really wow. was. It was That's an amazing true. thing. I'm not sure if, if it's there anymore. I think well, sure it's there. It is. I mean, the farmhouse Where would it have gone to? I don't know. I guess that's a no, good question. No, it's here. In fact, it's, it now part, it's now part of the park system now. Right. It was private. Yeah. Now it's part of the yeah, park. That's so funny. anyway, a little peek into pa yeah. the past, our past and mm -hmm. our, the past of the, of the nation. We're so glad the Lord saved the nation. We are talking from a, a United States, not a divided right. states. Right. Yes. Uh, coming up next, spiritual recovery for parents who have special needs children. We'll be right back. Israel, the land of promise. Join Cornerstone Television Network on a journey of a lifetime in the Holy Land as we celebrate Israel's 70th year of independence. Walk where Jesus walked in Jerusalem ride a boat across the Sea of Galilee, experience the wonder of the Garden of Gethsemane, and so much more on this special nine-day guided tour. Join Don, Terry, and the Cornerstone family on this once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage, October 9 through 17, 2018. 
Spots are limited, so go online or call today for more information and to make a reservation. Discover where God's prophetic promises were made, where they were kept, and where they are yet to be fulfilled in Israel, the land of promise. Diane Doko Kim knows the value of spiritual strength for special needs parents. In her book, Unbroken Faith, she brings a message of encouragement. Diane, welcome to Real Life. Thank you for having me. We're so glad you're here today. You, you want to talk about the tradition? Well, yeah, yeah. we have your first time on the air with us, right? Yep. Well, we want to know a little bit about you before we talk. Well, your, your book's about you too, but tell us about you. Where do you live and a little bit about your family, your husband, your children? Okay. Uh, my husband, Eddie, and I have been married since 1999, so about 19 years now. And we have two sons. One is 16 and another one is 12. And we have been serving in local church ministries together for about 25 years while working in the tech industry in Silicon Valley. Oh, okay. So you're out in the West Coast. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, quite a difference today. Yes, it is. I left 78 degrees to come into snow. <laughs> Well, we welcome you with yes. your bundled up clothing. Thank you. <laughs> well, your story is um, touches a lot of people's lives. That's right. Because it's shared by a lot of people. Do we have any idea how many special needs parents there are? Well, in the U.S., from what I last understand from the census, about 15 to 20 percent of families live with disability. So okay. that's 15 to 20 percent of the entire U.S. population live wow. with lifelong disability. Mm -hmm. 15 to 20 percent. Yeah. So that's a sizable group of folks. It is. Now, what, in, a, in a form of introduction, what prompted you to write your book, Unbroken Faith? Well, this was a book that I had never planned to write. Mm -hmm. um, in 2004, our family came back from serving a year abroad on missions. And our son, uh, Jeremy, was 18 months at the time, and he wasn't talking. And we thought it might be confusion from all the different languages that he heard abroad. So we had him tested out for a speech delay. Several months later, it turned out not to be a speech delay. And the results came back as autism instead. Now, I wish I could tell you I responded in a way befitting a missionary, but I didn't. I was utterly destroyed because now I had a child with a cognitive disability, but I found myself with a spiritual disability. Well, you found yourself with a spiritual disability. What, right. what do you that. mean by that? Well, um, I really felt, to be honest, quite betrayed by God. We had just stepped off the mission field. We had committed ourselves to full-time ministry, and this is what we got. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so everything that I had even gone to the other side of the planet to tell other people about God, now I really had to wrestle with. Mm. And I really just had to have a spiritual reset. And what does all of this mean to me? Um, and I really had my own kind of Mount Peniel experience, like Jacob wrestled with God. Mm -hmm. Now that all of my spiritual credentials were across the river and I had nothing, mm -hmm. I really had to wrestle with God and the promises of God. And so that kicked off about a five year period of depression and really wrestling with the word of God. And so after about five years, God didn't heal my son physically, but he healed me spiritually and emotionally. And the very thing that I thought would drive me away from God is exactly what drew me closer to him. Really? Yeah. Really? So in the the search and the reset, mm -hmm. what were some things that God showed you? It was really interesting to see that God had perfection in mind for his children too. And in this experience of special needs parenting, so many times parents like me feel like nobody understands what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. uh, but God himself, the Heavenly Father, he prepared perfection and expected perfection for his first children too but his children didn't turn out the way he expected or intended and his heart was also filled with pain, so he gets that. Mm -hmm. He also had perfection and um, just absolute perfection in mind for his children, so he understands that heartache that I have. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning. Wow. So you, you, you get the diagnosis, how old was your son when he was diagnosed? He was about 18 months. Okay. 18 months, so yeah. young. Very young. young. Mm -hmm. And then started the process and that I suspect that there's a protocol and you get into the protocol, but for five years, you said that you were living in a state of depression. Right, and so my son was getting all of this treatment. We had about a 40-hour therapy week, so we were seeing about 20 therapists going out, coming in, they were cycling in and out of our home, and all the attention went to our son, which he absolutely needed, 
but I was needing some kind of therapy or some kind of outlet myself, but yeah. the therapist only came for him. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, how does that, you know, like in the Christian church or in the Christian community, there's such a mixed message when it comes to special needs. Right. You know, there's one camp that, well, they're like, well, this is not of God, mm -hmm. you know, and so then there's another, there's another camp that, yes, they embrace it, they embrace special needs, but then you have, I think the most of us, that they don't, we don't know what to do, and so we don't, don't do anything. Exactly. Oh gosh, I'm so glad you asked that because this is such a complicated and sensitive area. And in the faith community, obviously people want to come alongside and they want to help, but they don't quite know how. And I think out of people's desire of wanting to say the right thing, sometimes they say things that may not land in the right way. And mm -hmm. a couple examples that I can think of is when uh, someone will come alongside a family who's had a recent diagnosis and say, oh, special needs children are a blessing, or God only gives special children to special parents. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that may be true, but at the time when you're bleeding from the heart, that's not quite what you need to hear at the time. Mm -hmm. And for you to reach a conclusion, to really wrestle with God, that this is a blessing, that whatever God brings into your life is a blessing, that's a journey that you have to take between you and God alone, and no one can reach that end conclusion for you. Wow. Well, how did this affect you and your husband? How Men take things differently, differently than women. How, how did this news hit him? That is a fantastic question. Um, we, in a sense, were kind of quintessential what happens to a mom and a dad, mm -hmm. in that uh, we were very much engaged in ministry, we're busy working, trying to raise our family, and for typically what happens is at least one parent will stay at home to become the primary caregiver and kind of traffic control for all of the therapists that are coming in. And so that was me. So um, I quit school. I was in graduate school for teaching at the time. And so I stayed home and I had an unplanned career change and I mm -hmm. became a full-time caregiver. And so I'm at home dealing with all the therapists and getting a complete reset of how I'm supposed to now uh, manage my son. And dads have a harder time with it. And first of all, practically speaking, dad is usually at work. Yeah. Um, sometimes even taking on additional jobs to pay for all of the therapy. So it's a tremendous pressure and stress. I, I call it like the perfect recipe to implode a family. Yeah. Um, so mom wants to get fully engaged. She wants to tell dad, this is what sure. the therapist said. Sure. Dad is having a hard time because men are wired in a way that they feel responsible for their families. That's right. So the fact that this happened on their watch, mm -hmm wounds a man in a way that women may not be able to understand completely. Mm. Oh, yeah. wow. I understand that. So did, but there's no help for him and no help for you, professionally speaking. Right. At, um, at that point, did you find help professionally speaking? We were very blessed in that we were part of a tight church community that really rallied around us like a family, like a mm. village, and that's the way a church should be. And so I had my people to go to. And I think for women, for sisters in Christ, it's easier for us to share our struggles and to yeah. find that fellowship. It took my husband a little bit longer. He had his man stuff to work through, mm -hmm. uh, but he had brothers and godly counsel that came around and said, you know, dude, when you're ready, we're here for you. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And your other that's child is older or younger? He's younger. He came along four years later. Okay. Now, that was a courageous move. Yeah, that's, that really was a courageous move. It, it, we actually struggled with it, and I'm glad you asked that because a lot of families, if the first child is diagnosed with a disability, especially knowing that there is a genetic component, they may hold off or decide not to. Mm -hmm. And so we really prayed, um, do we, do we not? Right. Also thinking we don't want Jeremy to be the only person. What, who's going to take care of him after we're gone? Right. So, so many of these things, and to be honest, I, we actually decided to pursue another pregnancy, had a couple miscarriages afterwards and thought, okay, well maybe this is not God's plan for us. Oh, and then came our second child. So wow. you can never predict what God's plan is going to be. Well, I wanted to ask you, I'm sorry, no, no. Oh, um, about for, for us in the church community, in the faith, how can we help? What can we do? You know, um, what are, you know, what are some ways that we can be a blessing and a help to special needs parents and children? I think the first thing is just awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, being aware that we exist, that there's 20% of us mm -hmm. in the U.S. that have this. Mm -hmm. And also an awareness that 90% of families like ours are not able to come to church. Okay. 90% are church. not because able to come church doesn't to. have facility? Partially it's just hard for us to get out of the house and to risk all that comes with it. Mm -hmm. I see. And also, yes, because a lot of the times only 10 to 15% of churches are equipped to know what to do with our families. Well, there's people watching with that situation, special needs in, right. in their home. Would you, would you look to the camera and say a prayer for them? Just ask them, ask God to bless them. Mm -hmm. Would you do that? Mm -hmm. You are my people. You're my tribe and know that God is with us. 
he suffers with us, he suffers for us, and he also has a plan to redeem. And what the enemy intended for harm, God can redeem into a blessing. And I know that may be hard to hear right now, but we have a redeeming God, and that's the only kind of God he knows how to be. Well, and, and I, I'd add to that, that you need to get as much help as you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As much help as you can, and that's why the mm -hmm. book's important. Right. Diane this wrote the book, book, Unbroken Faith, to kind of give that encouragement. Because the testimony of how God blessed and used one story is how will you bless and use yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. I know. Thank, Thank you for, for sharing. That's right. We yeah. should have pictures of your family. We don't have pictures. We need, I can send it. Send That'd us some pictures. Great. We'll show you some pictures as she as she goes back to sunny California <laughs> and shares shares her pictures with us. Well, let's let's go see what Sydney's found in the news. A Christian inmate filed a federal lawsuit after he says a prison denied him access to a Bible while he was in solitary confinement. Convert Hover claims his First Amendment rights were violated when prison guards would not give him one of his Bibles so he could do his daily devotionals. When he asked for a Bible, the prison reportedly gave him one in Spanish, which he could understand. Hover's lawyers say the case isn't about his criminal conviction, but his religious freedoms. Young people told Catholic leaders what they want to change about the church. 300 delegates from around the world went to the Vatican to share their ideas. They said the church should find creative ways to encounter people where they socialize, like in coffee shops, gyms, and bars. They also called for the church to be more transparent and provide rules for women where they can flourish. Their meeting comes ahead of a gathering set for October, which will focus on young people and their faith. Well, that's all for God in the Headlines. Have a great day on Purpose. All right, so hi, Diane. <laughs> so I'm a pastor and we have a church and we have a lot of families with special mm. needs. And how do, how do we as a church accommodate, help, support, pray, and help work alongside with you and your family? I love that you're asking. Uh, that tells me that you're already aware. Mm -hmm. So that was the first step. Mm -hmm. And I think secondly, it's just a practical thing. I think a lot of times folks are intimidated. They're afraid to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. Um, I'll tell you this. First of all, there's nothing you could say other than I have the cure. Mm -hmm. That's right. And right. a lot of times you don't have to say anything, but mm -hmm. just to come alongside and to lean in. It's that ministry of being there, ministry of presence. Be willing to sit with us. Even Jesus needed help in his darkest hour. Yes, what right. could his friends have done for him to alleviate his burden, right? right? But be willing to sit and just listen. We will do the talking. Mm -hmm. yeah. if we just need you to bring the emotional barf bag. We will fill it. Yes. <laughs> so just be That's willing to sit true. with us. Yeah. And also thirdly, know that you're not by yourself as a church. There are ministries like Johnny and Friends, like He Ministry. Mm -hmm. That is what they do. That is what God has equipped them to do, to come alongside local churches and say, this is how you do it. And that's what I've been doing for the last that's 10 years as well. That's a great resource. Yeah. Joan, is that Joni? Er Johnny er John Okay, yes. yes. I'm, I remember her. Yeah. That's right. That's great to have yeah. that ministry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we think you're awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. And just we're praying for you Thank and you. your family. And what a blessing that this book will be to help sort of come alongside and right. undergird mothers and fathers that have questions, concerns, and feel like they might be all alone right. or right. carrying the weight of the world. Right. And it gives and give a boost of faith. That's right. And for us That's right. and the community, when we do see a child having a seizure or having some challenges, that it's okay to go and say, what can I do to help? Exactly. You know, because I think a lot of times we're just sort of, we just sort of stand out of the way. Right. We're not, we were paralyzed. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to do, so we're passive. Right. Well, so we first, first thing I think you do is just start praying. You yeah. start praying. And you know, we talked about rest, we talked about entering into a supernatural rest. Mm -hmm. That's, that, that, that is applicable here. We have to right. enter into God's rest, into his peace, his shalom, because all around things are spinning kind of out of mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm. I imagine your house was out of control for mm -hmm. many, many years, but, it, but God brings rest in the middle of that. That's mm -hmm. why we're here with our coaching. We're going to find out how, how, how practically, and our coaching is coming up, how do we enter into God's rest? Interested in a product featured on today's Real Life? Now you can find all of your favorite books, CDs, DVDs, gifts, and more all in one place at ctvn.org backslash shop. Real Answers for Real Life 
Now delivered right to your mailbox. Now more than ever, it's important to stay connected. Here at Cornerstone, we want you to be in the loop. Call now for Real Life Today, the free newsletter that will keep you up to date on all of our programs and specials. It has encouraging articles and behind the scenes stories. Plus our brand new Christian Patriot Briefing. It's filled with ways that we can pray for our nation and take action. Real Life Today, the little newsletter that packs a giant punch. At Real Life Coaching, our goal is to help you become the very best you possible. And then when you're the best you possible, to win in life and win in life God's way. Well, what does it mean to be seated at God's table? Have you ever thought about that at God's table? Tom Gardner begins his coaching session in his book, Living the God-Breathed Life. Let's get started with coaching. Tom, in this first coaching session, I, I'm excited to, to be able to explore peace because yeah. this is such a chaotic world. Yeah. And it seems like it's getting more and more that way. But God has a desire for us to not live in that type of, a, of a environment, but to have the peace. The Bible says it passes understanding. Amen. Yeah, I think we aim a lot for understanding and basically we miss the peace. I think basically, uh, we have kind of made our human intelligence and our human ways kind of somewhere above God. Maybe we're experiencing a new Tower of Babel somehow. You know, we've kind of uh, looked at our own uh, understanding and our own mastery of the facts, let's say. Uh, but really, there is no peace there. You know, uh, when we talk about peace, I was just reflecting the other day and the prophet Jeremiah, <clears throat> as everything's becoming untangled in Jerusalem. In fact, if you think about it, it's actually very similar to what's happening now. If we think about the spiritual uh, culture of things, uh, things are un untangling, becoming all uh, uh, disconnected in uh, Jerusalem. And Jeremiah comes out with a statement and uh, he says, you know, these priests and these folks here in the temple, they're healing my people superficially. He says, they're saying that there's peace, peace, shalom, shalom, but there is no shalom, you know. Uh, but I think also, I think this is one of the keys to it. It says in the prophet Isaiah 26.3, it says that the steadfast of mind, the person whose mind is stayed on God will experience shalom, shalom, you know, the peace that is beyond our mere understanding. So I think basically there, the whole idea of peace as we see it is really more like what we're focused on, what it is that we're uh, really, what are we uh, listening to? What are we looking at? I think that's a big part of where we're uh, needing to find some peace. Well, the story you tell of Jesus and when uh, he was uh, being inquired and they asked him, well, wh where is your home? I think that is a re re relevant to where we are yeah. right now is yeah. why is it important? Why was it important for them to ask where, where is your home? Well, I think that whole, it arises out of this whole conversation that Jesus has. Uh, I think of in the, the, the first words that we might have ever seen or heard Jesus speak, he could have said anything. But when he has these two followers of John the Baptist who've done everything right, by the way, they followed the law, they followed the teachings, they followed John the Baptist, they've done all the things that they're supposed to do. But then John says, behold, here's the lamb. This is the one we're looking for. And so uh, he says, follow him to, to his two disciples. And these two disciples, you can almost see them, it's almost a humorous thing to contemplate. They're coming up out of the water, they've been baptizing, so they're trying to get their shoes on or their sandals on, and trying to get their, their garments all arranged, and they're, they're trying to follow after Jesus. And at some point, 
and this is an amazing point even in the Greek text of it, it says that they are following along and uh, once they're following the, uh, the footsteps of Jesus, it says that Jesus turned around. In fact, uh, I would translate it that Jesus became turned around. It's in a rare sort of a passive form and it says Jesus actually felt them following him. Mm -hmm. And it's something that turned them around, which, which uh, if I want to get God's attention, I think maybe I just need to follow. You know? So basically uh, the context is that he, he is on this journey, uh, two men following him on a road uh, to this particular place. And basically he becomes turned around and he looks right at them. And he says, what are you seeking? And when he says, what are you seeking, Don, he's actually saying, what's missing in your life? Because there's something that's missing. And I, and I think, uh, and I talk about this in the, in the, the uh, book that we'll discuss here. Uh, I talk about this a little bit later, that there is a longing in our hearts. And basically they are, there's a longing in their hearts and there's something that, that they are seeking after. And uh, basically then they ask him the question, which you and I, as disciples of Jesus or Yeshua, disciples of Jesus, we ask this question, Jesus or Rabbi, where do you live? And that is the main question. We want to know where it is that, uh, that he lives. And basically then he gives them the invitation, come and see. But it is our goal, I believe, as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, as ministers of Jesus, to abide where he abides, to go where he is, to live where he lives, to do the things that he's doing. Just as Jesus says, I only do what I see my father doing, uh, so it should be with us that we do what we see him doing. But he gives us first this really incisive question, what is it that you're seeking? What's missing in your life? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, our a ministry that we have and have had for more than 25 years now is really kind of helping people to find that missing place. I might call it the missing piece, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's like, uh, for instance, have you ever put together a puzzle? You, know, you put together these big puzzles, like mm -hmm. 500 or 1,000 piece puzzles. Imagine you, know, you have this, this picture on the front of it and what happens is if you, you take all those, the, the, the lid off and you pour out the, the pieces, what would happen if you got you know, only most of the pieces but you didn't get all the pieces? Mm -hmm. You would have a missing piece and you wouldn't have an accurate picture of what that was supposed to be like. I think that's where we operate a lot of the times. I think that basically you and I need to find a place where we are connected. When Jesus is saying, what is it that you're seeking? Mm -hmm. What we're really seeking is to be where he is, to live where he lives and to accept his invitation. And uh, when I read this passage of scripture and, and uh, when I write a book, basically I spend a lot of time just meditating in the scripture. And as I meditate in the scripture, uh, I kind of uh, have an image of it or a sense of what does it look like. Mm -hmm. And basically uh, what I see in this is that Jesus invites these two to go with him. And when he uh, invites the two to go with him, uh, they enter uh, into a place where he lives. Now we don't know 100% where that is, perhaps Capernaum. Uh, but we do know this interesting thing about it. This whole conversation, Don, takes place on Shabbat. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into the convoluted way I know that, but let's just say that you can write me and ask me. <laughs> but the, but the, let's just say though, uh, that there's about a 98% chance that this takes place on Shabbat. So imagine that they're having this conversation and it's about the 10th hour, it says in the text in John 1. And so they're walking along and they're having this conversation. They're throwing words back and forth and they're talking with Jesus. And it's about the hour when they need to get ready for Shabbat. Now the interesting thing about this, and this is really something for us to think about, they can't carry anything with them because it's Shabbat. They can't carry tools. They can't take any food. They can't take extra clothing. What this implies is that they have to trust Jesus, that wherever they're gonna end up, they're gonna have to trust that everything that they need has been provided. So I see this, I see this conversation playing out and them arriving at the place, wherever it is that he lives. And in fact, I can see that Jesus just kind of takes his, his, because he's a carpenter, he's a working guy, he uh, takes his calloused hand and he opens the door. And when he opens the door, there was probably only one piece of furniture there in that place where he wants them to come and let's use the word abide. Mm. 
He wants them to come and abide in this place of rest for him. And when you look at this, the piece of furniture that is likely there, there's really only one alternative. It's a table, a shulchan in Hebrew. He's, it's a table. And so what is Jesus doing? Jesus is actually inviting uh, you and I to a place of rest. And that's why we, we uh, kind of make the metaphor, the table, uh, such an, an important thing, which uh, uh, really is, again, we'll talk about later, but it talks about the table many, many places in Scripture. Uh, but the, the thing that Jesus is doing is bringing us, bringing you and I to a place of rest. And there are different places of rest. Uh, we talk about in the, in the book of Hebrews, and we had referenced that a little bit earlier when, in a personal conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about that in Hebrews, it says that the people, God's people, did not enter that place of rest. Well, why? Uh, they didn't enter the rest of God because of their unbelief. And actually, uh, Hebrews 4 is a quotation of Psalm 95. And it's basically saying that they could not enter his rest. He said, I swore in my wrath that they would not enter my rest. Uh, and they didn't enter the rest because they didn't trust God. This whole trust and this whole rest and this whole peace thing is really what it is that uh, comes with, uh, with this conversation that we're talking about. And so basically, uh, the conversation that we're referring to here in John 1 is a conversation that we have all day long. And it has very many practical ramifications. For instance, what am I seeking for my family? What am I seeking for my marriage, for instance? What am I seeking in my ministry? Mm -hmm. What am I seeking in my relationships with other people uh, in and through my life? What am I seeking? And then I have to ask also, where is Jesus living? Where is he living in the midst of all these arenas of thought and all these places of, of, uh, of activity in my life? Where is he living? Is he inviting me in that? I, I think a lot of times you and I miss the opportunities that we might have in the kingdom because we are so preoccupied yeah. with all the other unrestful stuff that we are missing what God is doing right here in the, in the midst of us, right here in, the, in front of us many times. So that, the whole conversation plays out in, in very, very practical ways. Now, when you said it was Shabbat, maybe some folks watching don't understand what you mean when you say that. Can you explain that? Sure. Uh, there are principally three words for rest that we, we would see in the Hebrew Bible, let's say. And when we look in the New Testament, we understand even though it's written in Greek, actually it's a Hebrew thought. Okay, Shabbat is the Sabbath. It's uh, from the Jewish perspective, it's the, it's the end of the week and the beginning of the next week. Uh, Sabbath or Shabbat is one of the words and that is a rest for the in, uh, express purpose of connecting with the presence of God and the heart of God. And we all need to do that. We need to be intentional and consistent about that. I could have saved about 300 pages of writing in my doctoral work if I would have just simply said, our spiritual growth and rest depends on being intentional and consistent about resting. <laughs> and if we would be that, as Jesus was very intentional about that, having quiet times with the Lord, then we will grow. Uh, so there's also another word, though. Uh, that word that uh, and it says that they will not enter into my rest, mm -hmm. which is, again, in Hebrews 4, but it quotes Psalm 95. That's actually a different word. That's the word nuach. Nuach is where we get the Hebrew name Noah. Because it says in Genesis that in him his people will find rest. So if you think about Nuach, Nuach is, uh, the first part is resting for connection with God. Uh, the next part is Nuach, which is in a, a, the rest which we come to in God or in Christ. For instance, Noah's ark. The ark is a kind of a, uh, it's another metaphor for Christ, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because as Noah is in that ark, as we are in Christ, there's a place of rest that is achieved. And the last part would be the word uh, shakat. Shakat is a, a word which means quiet. In fact, uh, uh, that's still a modern uh, Hebrew word that you would hear spoken uh, in Israel today. Uh, and it means be quiet. Uh, interesting thing about that first word, again, we, we have Shabbat, which is rest for connection. We have Nuach, which is coming to rest in God or in God through Christ. But that shakat word, the very first words that Jesus ever speaks of healing is the word shakat. Because he's having a conversation with the man, Mark 1, outside the synagogue. The man with the unclean spirit. Mm -hmm. His spirit is just filled and obliterated and destroyed with demonic stuff. 
and he begins to, to say things to Jesus. And Jesus' first words in Hebrew would have been shakat, be quiet. You see, that's what the Lord wants to do. He wants to bring you and I to a place of quiet inside so that we can receive all from him that he has for us. And isn't that, isn't that really the secret of much of the gospel? Mm. Is that peace? It is. That place of understanding and confidence that you don't have to strive and earn, but you can relax and rest in what Jesus has done for us. Amen. That's the message that Tom has put so eloquently in the book, Living the God-Breathed Life. This is a book that uh, is really a life changer in that it helps us to take back a lot of our life. Those 300 pages he could have saved, how many days or uh, minutes can we save in our day, in our life, just by being at a place of peace, of rest. S somebody that's watching this, many of you are at a place of strife. So this is going to be a uh, manna from heaven for you, your nourishment from heaven. So we want to plant this into your life, want to make a gift to you of this book, along with the DVD that we've created with Tom at, in, on his visit here that can't be found anywhere else. This is exclusive to us in the Cornerstone family, and we do thank you for doing, doing that with us. And this is a combination that helps us to find and then enter into that, that rest. I know for myself, that's the goal. That's one of my goals is to find that place of peace. It's in that place of peace that you're going to find power. I know it's, it seems odd that I'd say that, but that is a fact. That is the fact of the way the Spirit works. So with your best gift to the ministry, you ask the Lord what that is. We're going to ship this. We'll take care of the shipping and handling. Get both the DVD and the book into your life. Because my goal for you, my friend, is that you would be able to live that life that Jesus has promised. The life that he lived. We're going to go on into coaching sessions with Tom and get deeper and deeper into this concept of the table and what God's doing at the table. Just imagine being at the table, and I'm going to save that for another coaching session, to be with Jesus at the table. What a wonderful experience. But when you're with Christ, no matter where you are, you have an experience with him that changes lives. Stories like this happen. My husband, Tony, was having bypass surgery. He had six blockages to his heart. I was worried sick about him. He's the love of my life and my best friend. I didn't want to lose him. I called the Cornerstone prayer line. I just had to talk to somebody. They listened to me cry, and then they prayed with me, which gave me a lot of peace. The next day, my husband had surgery, and I called to tell the prayer partners that Tony had made it through the surgery with flying colors. Even the nurses were amazed at his recovery. I like that. Even the nurses were amazed. I know. Yeah. I was wanting to say, yay, God. I like her Bible, mm -hmm. all of the highlighted yeah. scriptures and yeah. pages. Mm -hmm. That's a woman of God. That's mm -hmm. A woman who's got into the Word yep. and studied right. the Word. Mm -hmm. But challenges come to those. All, all yes. of us face challenges, ladies. We sure we're do. Not, none of us are in a place where we don't have to face the adversity. Yeah. Jesus mm -hmm. said it. He said very clearly, in this life you will have tribulation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But be of good cheer, for I have, what he said, overcome, overcome the world. And so sometimes in those tribulations, we have to go through them, you know? Yes. And so I know there's sometimes we think that as Christians, we don't need to have any of that, that we can be delivered from it. But a lot of times we have to actually, our deliverance is going through something like that. Any tribulation. Remember that song? You can't go through it, gotta go around. You know, I mean, there's yeah. no way you can just um, ignore or not have troubles mm -hmm. and trials. And it's called life. We live right. in a fallen world. Mm -hmm. We're not really even of this world. We have a, a right. home right. that while we're here and while right. really sin is reigning on earth, we've That's got to right. navigate life and mm -hmm. we've got to do it um, with 
the rest of God. Mm -hmm. We need God breathe rest That's because right. there's nothing that will steal your rest, steal your peace, and That's steal right. your joy like a good old tribulation. That's right. <laughs> Good old tribulation. And you know, that's true because your focus is on the tribulation. It's exhausting. Yes. And you're all keyed up inside and you're tensed up and you can't sleep at night. And, uh -oh. and the enemy just wants you to think about it. it wa he wants to consume your mind mm -hmm. with this issue or this thing where you'll never find that deep rest. And right. it's, not, it's not right. Mm -mm. Well, l let, me th let me twist it just a little bit. <clears throat> twist the angle just okay. a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because I agree with everything that you guys said. There's another angle, though. I want to present to you another angle. There are a lot of things that we go through that, that God takes us through. Mm -hmm. But we're never conscious of them. Because mm -hmm. His angels are guarding us. Ooh, His Spirit so leads us. Yep. You don't know how many times you were on a path that would have led right. to a car accident. Right. Or there was another uh, tragedy that was just around the corner, but God saved you from it. Mm. I know that happens all the time. Now, do I have evidence that shows you this happened on this date and this that? Some, most of the time, not. Most because they they're beyond our knowledge. Now, if you take that, if you believe that, say Amen, 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 Amen. 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 Oh. Because <laughs> because if you believe that, there is a sense of right. peace that can rise up in us. Yes. Because mm -hmm. if God could take care of the unseen, keep us from harm, mm -hmm. why can't He take care of the seen? That's true. Same, same God, same resources. See, because we're engaged in this scene. And that's what the, the challenge is because we get in God's way, I'm sure, often because right. of our unbelief and the, the, the fear that we take on. I'm not condemning anybody, but right. it's just the way I am. Yeah. And we're, 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 we're ministering here in this regard to what Tom's message is, is rest. Right. Shalom. Well, it, how do you handle, though, your rest for yourself, but a lot of times your concern and your tribulations is for other people you love. You know, mm -hmm. that's where you were concerned about, you know. Um, you know, you can pray for angels watching over me right. and you pray for angels watching over them, but then they also have free will. I, yeah. Where does all that fit in with, with other people? Honestly, I would say by renewing your mind with the word. I mean, over and over, I would read Psalm 91, Psalm 91. And then these thoughts are coming, especially when you have a teenager <laughs> with a car and like an independent and you're just right. like, you know, these terrible thoughts come of yeah. destruction. They do. And I mean, one day I was walking and guess what came up to me just as loud and clear. I mean, down deep on the inside, it was a scripture. No destruction shall come near your dwelling. Mm -hmm. And it was like that scripture just stood out and was as strong and boisterous in my mind. And I thought, Yes, you're right. I, you, it's the word of God. It's the washing right. of the water of the word. Mm -hmm. So what you, what you want to do is you want to feed on this and what God's word says mm -hmm. so that that way you're, you're, the enemy can't steal from you because nothing's happened. Right, that's nothing's true. Nothing's happened that's and right. you're thinking it. That's, that's right. right. You're Absolutely. visualizing this whole thing that, that doesn't exist. That's right. what 80% of worry is, right. Amy. 80% mm -hmm. of what we worry about never ever exist. Mm -hmm. It's a fabrication of our imagination prompted by, by the, I think, the devil's indicators inside of us that wants us to start worrying and fearing yeah. and doing everything that's counter to faith. The faith is the process of believing God, even though I can't see him and understanding mm -hmm. in his love, trusting in his love and knowing that he's going to take care of me. And, you know, I have ultimately put my trust in him, Terry, because I'm going to go to, I, I confident that I'm going to go to heaven and right. be with the Lord. Right. So if I can have that confidence now that I'm going to yeah. go to heaven someday, why can't I have the confidence now that God's got today in his hands? Well, and to take care of our family. Family. You know, and even if some of our family members are having, you know, uh, struggles right sure. now, you yeah. know, sure. um, so we just have to trust that God has their back as well. Trust. Mm -hmm. Enter into his rest. That's what this teach is all about. Mm -hmm. Living the God breathed. Hear mm -hmm. that? God breathed life. That's how God created mm -hmm. us. He mm -hmm. breathed yes. onto that clay or dirt. Tom's going to later on talk about it being dust. Mm -hmm. He breathed in the condensation of his breath, formed the moisture on the dust. And with mm -hmm. that, he formed, our, he formed us. Mm. Wow. See, that's how God is. It's God breathed. Now, 
that's, uh, we, we, I think it'd be great for you to have this teaching. Tom's a really uh, great Bible teacher and he uses the original language. He's, he's an expert in Greek and Hebrew and so mm -hmm. you're able to dig deeper into the, the, the root words and understand it at a level that, you know, you normally don't get that kind of teaching. So with your gift to the ministry, whatever the Lord places in your heart, we want to give you this book and this DVD that would become your tool for mm -hmm. entering into that place. Because you know what? The Lord wants us to be at peace. Yes. Mm -hmm. He yes. wants us to be at peace. He wants us to have rest. Yes. Now, again, rest is not sleep. That's right. Rest is being able to get away from the world Put yourself in your secret place, and in that secret place, just be able to enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Don't go in with your big long list. Right. It's okay to have petitions and lists. Sometimes those are really good things to do. But this isn't what that, this is a, a season of celebrating His love for you and your mm -hmm. love for Him, and you're just there. Maybe you're listening, maybe you're praying, maybe you're praying in the Spirit. God will lead you, get into the space. And see, that's what, that's what that shalom comes from. God's peace in his presence. Mm -hmm. His peace in his presence. Well, that's very important for us, yeah, ladies. That's right. For us to mm -hmm. enter into that yeah. place of peace and rest. Mm -hmm. Because the six days a week. Well, you work. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Work your little tail off. Mm -hmm. And then one day you got to rest, baby. Mm -hmm. I couldn't help but think while he was talking about Psalm 20, 23. I mean, if you need a good place to start, just in your quiet time, read Psalm 23. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I mm -hmm. will not lack for any good thing. He mm -hmm. leadeth me beside what? Still Watch waters. Mm -hmm. He restores my soul. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're looking to other things or meditation or yoga or, or I mean, all kinds of things to find deep restoration of the soul. And you're only going to find it in the presence of, and in mm -hmm. quietness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, mm -hmm. I'm going to fear no evil. And at the very end, surely goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. Amen. I mean, it's this whole mm -hmm. journey of the, mm -hmm. he's a good shepherd. He's he going is. to be with you. He's going to guide you. He's He's going to take you through the troubled times and through the valleys and the hills and the, the, the ebbs and flows of life and he'll yes. be with you and Hallelujah. he'll keep you. That's right. I like he does keep us. Yes. He does. He keeps you and I and our families. What mm -hmm. a promise. What a yeah. promise for us to hold on to in the middle of the uncertainty. We know we have some one thing, this one thing that we can hold to. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is not a piece of literature. Right. This is a covenant to you and to me. Okay. We'd love to pray with you. I'd love for you to call us at 888-665-4483. You know, that prayer line's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're gonna pray right now. Let's stretch yes. your hand out towards us at home and let's pray together. Yes. Father, I thank you for the peace of God that passes understanding. Yes. Lord, every one of these thank prayer requests, Lord, we pray for your will and your purpose to be uh, revealed, yes. God. Show them who they are in you, Father. Touch their hearts, touch their bodies, touch their families, God. Restore their health in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for our supernatural move of healing right now in Jesus' name. Lord, deliverance in Jesus' name. Lord, yes. safety yes. in Jesus' name, restoration in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Father, that you're the, you're the yes. promise keeper. And we thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you. Let your peace, for everybody who's watching, let your peace fill these homes in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. We love you. We'll see you on our next Real Life. Stone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.